Hello, I'm Philip Hooker, VP of Strategic Programs at Software AG, who are initiator of the open source Thin Edge to IO project. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this fifth Thin Edge to IO community meetup. We've got a range of presentations and practical demonstrations from the Thin Edge to IO team and contributors, which cover what's new in the latest version, how it can be used and extended, and real implementation examples. But before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. We're using Teams webinar for this meetup, so if you hover your cursor over the main window, the window control bar will be shown. The control bar allows you to raise your hand if you have a question, show the meeting chat sidebar, view participants, and leave the webinar. If you have any questions during the session, you can submit these through the chat or raise your hand at the end of the session. The presenters will answer questions at the end of each session, but please feel free to ask your questions at any time during the presentations. For those with the hands raised, we will unmute your mic. You can actually ask your question directly when called on. We're trying to keep this interactive, so we'll launch a couple of surveys or polls to capture your opinions on important topics. These will initially appear as pop-ups, but will also be available in the meeting chat sidebar for later review. If you want to enlarge the display to full screen or need to check your audio settings, please click the ellipsis three dot symbol in the middle of the control bar for the submenu. I'll be introducing the agenda in our first speaker in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to say a few words about the Thin Edge IO community. The Thin Edge IO community is an online and in-person tech enthusiast group who are excited about the practical implementation of Thin Edge IO, the open source cloud agnostic IoT framework designed for resource constrained edge devices. We're an eclectic group of IoT, OT and IT professionals. From the core development team, contributors, the open source community, all experienced in the use of industry proven security, connectivity and software management methods for lightweight deployments. During the sessions, we aim to replicate ThinEdge.io's no-nonsense approach with interactive technology demonstrations so you can learn from both the successes and challenges we face creating them. So we're continually evolving our approach to allow more time for technical deep dives interactions with the Thin Edge IO team and contributors. We'll kick off with a brief preview of release 0 0.8 from the Thin Edge IO team. Then we'll immediately move into technical sessions from our contributing partners, covering integrating industrial assets using OPC UA, delivering motorsport telemetry for the ERA championship, connecting to AWS IoT, and deploying in the Octo embedded framework. Time allowing, all of these sessions will be followed by a short Q&A. This then rolls on to our open Guru Bar and networking session at the end to cover any topics that may have not been covered or any questions you may have or any contributions you may have to the, um, the areas we've actually discussed. So the Thin Edge Data project is progressing at a rapid pace. I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Andre Schreiner, Edge Product Manager from the Thin Edge Data team, who's going to provide a preview of the new features and updates to ThinEdge.io that will shortly be available in release 0 to 8. Andre, over to you. Thank you, Phil. So, yeah, and also welcome from my side. Um, in the next 10 minutes, I will share, as Phil mentioned, the highlights of the planned uh, 0 0.8 release of ThinEdge.io. Um, so, but before I do that, uh, let's start with the obligatory recap of the project for the ones who might be very new to the project and the community. So with ThinEdge.io, we want to make uh, IoT device enablement easy and at the same time without creating any ecosystem of platform lock-in. So to achieve this, we are building a modular lightweight IoT device framework. That's why we call it Thin. As a foundation for your IoT project. So it can be deployed on resource constrained devices such as PLC or protocol gateways um, and allows out of the box connectivity and most importantly, the device management uh, functionalities for uh, the specific device without relying on a specific IoT or cloud platform. And to achieve our mission, we join forces with partner companies from the industry or industrial automation space. Um, and we are welcoming also new partners and individual contributors to collaborate with us. Now, most of you know this, but when developing ThinEdge.io, we focus on a set of key principles 
uh, key principles, which are freedom of choice for languages, message payloads and platforms that can be used with it, a comprehensive and extensible device management feature set with plugin mechanisms uh, to support things like software management, firmware management and configuration management, and being modular and efficient in terms of resource consumption on the device is one of the uh, other important aspects. So all in all, Finish IO offers a unique approach to unify the needs both of the IT, but also on the operation technology world by offering a platform design focused on efficiency, robustness, security, while uh, offering the highest level of extensibility. And we are, of course, again, not restricting users towards one specific um, software artifact package manager or uh, programming language. Now let's take a very quick look on where the project is today and what is available today in terms of functionality. Let's start quickly with the um, our MQTT interface, which we use for both cloud and internal communication. And um, um, here we are uh, using um, an MQTT broker to simplify the uh, interoperation and uh, communication between the different components. And we also use uh, optional uh, ThinEdge uh, JSON MQTT payload uh, that can be used to uh, send uh, telemetry data to the various IoT platforms. We, uh, and I will talk about it later on, we also focused a lot on the support of downstream or child devices, um, which is really important because in most cases ThinEdge is used as a gateway device uh, to connect to uh, field bus protocols, to connect to industrial assets and machines. Now, Regarding cloud connectivity, today uh, we support Cumulosity IT, Azure IT, and we also will see today a first preview of an AWS IoT integration, um, all with uh, a device certificate as an authentication mechanism. And now to the um, central uh, feature set, which is uh, always the focus for us, uh, which is the device management aspect. So things like uh, having the ability of monitoring the device and its services, doing software management from IoT platforms or for device management platforms and handling different types of uh, package types and software artifacts is a key focus of the project, including aspects like configuration management. I will go later into more detail on the usability of ThinHIO. Uh, we included a command line interface to with a couple of commands uh, control the behavior of ThinEdge operated and do things like connecting it to an IoT platform. On the left, left side, one very important aspect is that we are open to integrations and extensions of ThinEdge IO through either uh, components that you want to build or existing components and frameworks and open source projects that are already there in the uh, IoT space. And for that, we specifically also created an examples repository on GitHub where you can check out um, a lot of the examples that we will also see today. Now let's come to the uh, uh, 0.8 release. Uh, I will give you a little bit of a preview of what we are currently working on and what will be available in the next release. So um, here I want to open up with some typical use cases we see in our um, early adopters using ThinEdge uh, currently. So often um, um, those users have uh, ThinEdge running on PLCs or industrial gateways. Here ThinEdge is a gateway for downstream or what we call child devices, which means this can be physical devices that are connected to, to ThinEdge or virtual devices like simulators or protocol drivers. And in previous releases, we already have implemented a, a basic support for exchanging measurements and telemetry from those devices and pushing them up to the IoT platform. And now we continue to focus uh, on that and offering more functionalities around child devices. So one important aspect is the handling of events and alarms, meaning if you have a PLC or machine component that is connected to ThinEdge, which already can generate alarms, for example, those can be then sent directly to your preferred cloud or IT platform. But also you can do data pre-processing of a sensor value, for example, on the thin edge itself, generate an alarm and then assign that alarm to the specific child device. It all works by picking the right MQTT topic and payload format. The other important aspect is the configuration management aspect. So what is configuration management in our definition? Child devices 
a thin edge itself as well, might need to be configured like network configurations, or maybe you have a data mapping that you need to do and it's all exposed in a configuration file. Um, maybe you want to configure a specific field bus protocol. You do the mapping between a Modbus register and um, a measurement. And for this, you have uh, multiple configuration files usually located on the device, on the thin edge device, which need to be remotely modified from an IoT or cloud platform. Um, either you can use UIs for that or whatever the IoT platform vendor offers. And for that, we implemented and we're working on a generic functionality on how to do that. So configuration management for child devices um, that then can be used in, uh, and integrated with clouds. And for the next release, we are working on a generic support on the thin edge side and a reference implementation with uh, the Cumulosity device management functionality. Some other things that we worked on, which uh, help especially developers who extend or customize thin edge, are things like uh, cleaning up the thin edge artifacts if you you know do experiments with it. Um, so we introduced a cleanup script which allows to either delete thin edge components while keeping the configuration files for the next time when you want to re uh, reinstall it, or a purge uh, command to delete all the elements, inclu including the configuration files. Um, just something that is very useful uh, for for the development. And last but not least. Um, we also further enhance the service monitoring options um, via MQTT, which is very useful if you plan to extend and add new logic to ThinEdge. You might want to uh, use the health endpoints for the ThinEdge plugin extensions, which allow you to check uh, the state of a ThinEdge service and you know uh, build your logic uh, on top of that information. Now, um, as Phil mentioned today, you will see a lot of exciting demos, and I also wanted to highlight those partner and community contributions as they're really important for the project. So in many IoT projects, and that's what I want to highlight first, and we will see that today, uh, um, uh, vendors prefer to build custom Linux images for their devices, for their IoT devices. And for this, they often use the Yocto project, which is a, a Linux Foundation project to make sure um, that ThinEdge I.O. can also run and be part of those custom images. Our partner uh, Inetum um, have created an example integration of ThinEdge I.O. Uh, with Yocto, so you can create your own custom Linux build with Yocto with ThinEdge I.O. included. We will see that later on. And then um, another aspect uh, I wanted to highlight is, uh, yeah, we always stress that being cloud agnostic is a key focus for ThinEdge I.O. Therefore, not only the uh, components on the device need to be independent from any cloud vendor, but also we need uh, more mappers and integrations with other IoT platforms than we have today. And today uh, we will finally see an example on uh, integration with AWS IoT from our partner Consult Red, something that I really look forward to. And uh, then, uh, and this will be more in the beginning, one of the most exciting use cases for thin is the software G ERA championship and electric racing series where ThinEdge IO is used in the racing car. So really exciting and cool stuff uh, to push valuable data in real time during a race so the teams can make better decisions and pick the right strategy. I mean, something really cool. Uh, looking forward to that. And I also wanted to mention another contribution, another example, uh, which we'll not see today, but you can explore and try it out yourself on the uh, GitHub examples repository. Um, so it's a Cumulosity service monitoring feature with an integration um, uh, uh, based on ThinEdge, uh, which uh, our software AG colleague Murad Bayram has uh, contributed. And uh, that's uh, um, useful functionality if you want to uh, have a nice user interface uh, in Cumulosity IT to make sure that all the ThinEdge services and maybe other services that you want to monitor are running um, and, and check the state of them. So all of this is in the examples repo. And um, yeah, if you want to get started, explore some of that functionality or deep dive into the project. Of course, uh, our GitHub uh, is the first uh, point uh, here. And uh, to find tutorials, instructions on how to use ThinEdge, how to install it on your device, you can check out our documentation um, on, on the website. Now, last but not least, to end, um, yeah, we work with various partners already and we try to grow the list. So if you believe in the idea 
secret behind Synedge. No matter if you want to use or contribute to it, uh, to it, reach out uh, to us uh, either by email or Discord, and we can uh, discuss how to best collaborate. Um, and uh, we also work with different partnership models. So um, contribution is 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 a good thing, but not a must have to also support the project. Um, thank you, and back to Phil um, for the other sessions. Uh, excellent. Thanks, Andre. Great, great summary. So I think we have some um, uh, questions that were kind of brought up uh, already. So I think one's been answered regarding the integration of uh, ThinEdge.io and Cumulosity. I think Murat's going to cover that uh, in the session uh, in just in a couple of minutes. Uh, there's also a question regarding uh, MindSphere, uh, about the integration with the MindSphere. So do you want to uh, state something about that? Yes, yeah, so there is already an integration with the MindSphere product suite, right? Uh, so there is uh, also com compatibility in, in certain MindSphere extensions um, with Cumulosity I2. So therefore, um, that can be used to integrate uh, a, any device into the MindSphere world. Yeah, we can we can uh, go deeper on that, uh, Boris, and I can show you how that works. Brilliant, brilliant. And there's a question here about um, uh, can we share the slides? Uh, we're very keen to share the slides, so you can share them with the colleagues. So um, um, we will we'll make uh, uh, we'll make them available to everybody who's been on the call today. So I think we we've got close to the end of that session, so we need to um, uh, sort of move on. So thank you, thank you, Andre. Now uh, we'll we come back, I'm sure, in the um, the Guru session right at the very end. So now it's uh, now it's time to start our te technical sessions. So OPCOA, as um, uh, Andres mentioned, OPCOA is becoming one of the most important communication standards for industrial IoT. It is a platform independent service oriented communication architecture for reliable, secure and multi-vendor data transport from production level to production planning level. Um, what? Um, so with this, I'd like to introduce uh, Murat from Software AG, who will demonstrate how ThinEdge.io can be used to integrate industrial assets using OPC UA to Software AG's Cumulosity IoT platform. So Murat, over to you. Thank you, Phil. Let me share my screen. Perfect. So as uh, already introduced, <laughs> my name is Mora Bayer. I'm a solution engineer uh, on the software AG side. And uh, today I'm going to show you, because it was already a question, how the Cumulosity IoT can be combined with ThinEdge. And uh, in a, a very specific topic here today, uh, how we do that with our OPC UA agent approach uh, to connect, for example, to an OPC UA server. Just a, just a few words to me. So I, before joining Software AG a couple of years ago, I was working in manufacturing. So this is why I, I mainly work in projects that are related to industrial assets, machines, uh, or, or any other th thing that has to do with, with manufacturing or, or industries. Um, and that means from, from my uh, position point of view that uh, we actually take care at the very early stage how to connect uh, connect those industrial assets to the Cumulosity IoT platform. And that means for me, basically, that we are checking how controllers, gateways, um, et cetera, can be connected to the Cumulosity IoT platform. So we have a large zoo of device partners um, we work with. So Bob is, is also here in the channel. So for example, the, the revolution platform Kunbus, but also um, HMS gateways, so the E1 Flexi on the upper right, um, or other uh, controller manufacturers such as uh, Red Lion or, or Phoenix Contact or Vago. So usually my, my daily work is to see what does the customer uh, already have on the industrial on the industrial asset side or what what he needs. So because every every of this gateway usually has his its certain domain or its niche where it's uh, it's located or where it's very good at. And with this large zoo of devices, just just a short, uh, just a short uh, amount here, there comes also a, a huge uh, large of different protocols. So um, 
like if we talk to customers, we, we we see many types of protocols, and this changed over over the years. So when I when I started a couple of years ago, uh, there were other protocols much more common than than nowadays. So the TCP/IP-based uh, real-time communications, such as Ethercut from Backoff or or Profibus, that was yeah, this is already a few years back when this was used mainly by Siemens, but also stuff like Mapbus that is still used quite often, but or, or MBUS in, in the metering uh, segment can, we see that quite often in terms of um, um, mobile equipment, bugnet, uh, a lot in buildings and, and many others. So I could put like, I don't know, 200 others here on the slide, just that you get the idea. And then I don't know how many years back, then OPC started this uh, unified architecture idea um, to unify all these different protocols and somehow it worked. So we do see that actually, that customers actually use OPC UA to, to make this, this zoo uh, much more uh, unified. Um, and this makes it also easier for us because uh, if OPC UA is present at this industrial asset, then it's very easy for us because it's, it's somehow standardized how to write information uh, on an address space, for example, uh, it makes it much easier for us to connect to th this information source. And this is why, for example, we as Software G uh, have an approach uh, that is called Cloud Field Bus. Uh, so it's a server side configuration point of view where you configure basically what types of information you want to extract from, for example, OPC UA. The same concept works for, for Modbus. You see that here on the left side, we do the same idea for, for Lorio, Modbus, Can, Profibus, all the field buses. And the idea is here to provide a specialized component in terms of extracting information and mapping those to the Cumulosity IoT model, such that I can monitor information on the Cumulosity and then do dashboarding or streaming analytics. So, but that's a very specialized solution, right? So it's extracting information from, from, an, from an address space, from, from registers or, or, or whatsoever. Um, so, but then Edge, and you already have seen a similar slide from Andre just a couple of minutes ago, ThinEdge now adds to that specialized functionality, adds something that is actually kind of commodity because you need it. So you need kind of a device management to manage those gateways I just showed on the very first slide. So to manage how they are configured, what should they do and what, what interval should they, they rescan uh, address spaces and whatsoever. And this comes with ThinEdge, right? So it's everything that is here below in the yellow part. So you can configure, you can monitor, you can manage your physical device. And then there comes the specialization, right? And we call that components. And one component in this example is what I'm gonna show you today is, for example, a protocol driver for OPC UA. But the basic concept works for every protocol driver. So if you have something that is very specialized in extracting information from Profibus or from an IO link or whatsoever, this would be basically just a component that does its functionality within the ThinEdge framework here. And ThinEdge is taking care for the rest uh, in terms of device management and other functionalities. So, and this is what I'm gonna show you today. Um, you can also see that, so it's it's nothing hidden or anything. So we we push that heavily on GitHub. So we do have an example section on on the ThinEdge uh, uh, repository, so you can look in that. So they are uh, they are examples from me, but also from my colleagues. So we're heavily putting stuff there and documenting that, so that you can can do that and use that and also like adjust it. But uh, feel free to to dive into that. We we, we are really looking for feedback here. Uh, if you have nice ideas, then just reach out. Would be very nice to get in some discussions here. Let's do it a little bit step by step that you see that. So I prepared a little live demonstration on that you see how our OPC UA approach together with the ThinEdge works. Um, so use the architecture slide and make it a little bit uh, thinner, right? So we, we remove everything and then you see it's basically yellow and blue, right? The yellow part is the thin edge part and the blue part is the, speci uh, the, speci uh, the specialized component. In this example, it's the OPC UA gateway agent from Software AG.
So and the first thing we start with, that's a standard vintage device, right? So I mean, we uh, in Cumulosity language, we call everything a device. Um, since Cumulosity was founded almost 12 years ago, there was not the word digital twin or anything, but basically a device is a is a, a virtual representation of something, right? It could be physical, it could be also uh, some virtual representation of something virtual. You will see that in a minute. And let's move to the tenant, and then you can see that. So I have a nice, freshly branded Cumulosity tenant in here. Uh, and uh, what we can see here when I go on to the all device sections, I can see my parent gateway device, and that's actually my physical gateway. So for example, the Kunbus Revolution Pi or the gateway from HMS. And what I can do in here uh, is what Andre already mentioned. I can see meta information about my device, right? So it's basically a digital twin, you would say it nowadays about what version is my, my um, thin edge installed here on this physical device? Where is it located? Uh, was it available in the last couple of minutes? Um, all this meta information to this particular physical device, right? And also more information to this device. Uh, Andre showed you, for example, measurements. So what is my CPU doing on this gateway? Uh, how is the memory used? Um, I can also do configuration. So maybe I want to push a new firewall configuration to this uh, to this gateway, um, or I can see the services. This is what Andre already mentioned. Um, so what system D services are running? Are they all up? Are they down? Uh, are they restarting? Or I can, for example, request log re files from this particular gateway. So who was logging into that, etc. So that's really pure plain device management. Going back to the slides, now there comes the specialization, right? We want to connect to OPC UA. And we had already, or we do have a solution that is called OPC UA Gateway Agent. And that's, we model that as a child device. So it is in a physical representation, a child device within the thin edge. Um, and that's our component basically, right? That is, um, that is uh, responsible for connecting to an OPC UA server, um, that is responsible for extracting data and so on. And that is for monitoring and managing the OPC UA server. So this is basically a virtual representation of the OPC UA server itself. So how does it look like in the actual tenant? We see here in the top of my actual parent gateway device, we see a tab that is called child devices, right? And in this child devices, I see my gateway component in here that is called OPC UA gateway. And that's actually my special specialized component. And if I click on that, then basically the screen slightly changes. But again, I can now start seeing what is this particular component doing, right? So how many servers are connected, how many active threads I do have on this gateway. Uh, so again, it's monitoring of this particular component. I can configure that component via the device management here of the Cumulosity. Or I could even change the whole firmware of that because I say, OK, I do have a new version of this. Uh, so let's replace that, for example, with a newer version. What I can also do, and this is more, more, uh, more, uh, more special now to OPC UA, I can configure an OPC UA server I want to connect to. So we are basically using the gateway as a jump host here, right? Because I can, for example, configure an OPC UA server that is locally in the environment, and I want to connect to that, right? So in this example here in my demo, I prepared a simulation server. Um, so data is, uh, is uh, generated and simulated, and I now save this configuration of this OPC UA server. So even if with user credentials, for example, if I, if I had configured one, and then I can save that. And if I save that, then Again, you see there's a child device section of this particular gateway. And this OPC UA server will be modeled as a child device. Again, so I could even configure multiple servers here, and I would have multiple child devices. And here I can now monitor the OPC UA server directly, meaning, for example, how is the server response side of the OPC UA server? That's a quite common use case, actually, because we see many customers 
not monitoring the OPC UA servers, for example. So how many clients are connected to that? How long does it take till uh, informations are extracted, etc. There's another tab in here that is called address space. And that's very nice because now on this particular virtual representation of the OPC UA server, I can see what is my information model on the OPC UA server. So for example, I can see that I do have here a thin edge factory um, and uh, thin edge customer that has a factory one, two, three, and that has several lines and there is a machine and there are some variables. For example, there are drives where I do get the power extracted. So, and this comes directly from the OPC UA server. So what is basically the specialized component from us is doing, it's scanning the address space of the OPC UA server and sending this here to the Cumulosity IoT platform such that I can go through that and apply a data model later on. So and that would already be the next question, right? So as you might guess, the data mapper is also a child device of this particular OPC UA server. So if I want to create a data mapping based on the information in this address space, so based on node IDs or attributes in this OPC UA server, I can manage and monitor them uh, and we model that as a child device under the OPC UA server that was just created. So and how does this look like in the uh, Cumulosity IoT platform? So we call that, and there we have to go a step back, we call that device protocols. So you would basically add a device protocol in here. Let's do that together. And then the Cumulosity IoT is asking me, okay, what type of device protocol is it? Is it CAN, is it Modbus, is it Profibus, or is it in this example OPC UA? So I give it a day name. Then it's asking me, of course, on, on which basis do I want to apply this, uh, this mapping? And this is, of course, uh, as an example of this OPC UA server I created. Uh, let's cut out a little bit. And in here now, I can define which variables or attributes on this OPC UA server I want to extract. So in here, I do see now the data model on the particular OPC UA server that was scanned prior. I can check that. I can see, okay, I do have factory two. There's my machine. There are the drives. And I want to, for example, extract the power. And now I can define, hey, use this power actually and send a measurement to Cumulosity. So let's call that drives. And the series is power, for example, and the unit is what. So I can even define now how often I want to send this data to the Cumulosity platform. So I could say, okay, make a subscription. So do that only if the uh, value changes by, for example, 20% or 10%, um, or I could just do a cycle read and let's do that because you probably want to see something. I save that. Um, let's do the all overall as well here. And then you will see that this live mapping I just created will also be modeled as a child device in the OPC UA uh, server section on the Cumulosity. So again, here's this child device. So if I click on that, then there's still the old one. I will show you the old one. And then you see, again, my data mapping itself is just a device I can monitor and manage here. So for example, uh, oh, there it is. Sorry, I misclicked. So there's a live one now as well. Um, so th that's a, I can monitor. Uh, I can monitor the mapping in here. So for example, I can see the measurements here. Um, let's switch to the last minute. So and then I can say see here that the uh, simulated power of the drive of this particular machine is now extracted and transformed to the Cumulosity IT platform uh, as measurements in here. And you can see that here in the measurement section. So if we go back to the slides, getting the overall picture. So we model basically the physical hardware, the physical gateway as a thin edge device uh, to have uh, monitoring and management capabilities of the whole physical gateway. We create a child device 
uh, which is then my specialized component. In this example, it's OPC UA, but it could be anything else um, that we are capable of now monitoring and managing. And then we create a data mapping. So what types of information I want to extract from this OPC UA server in this example. Uh, and this is also, again, a child device such that we have a plain hierarchy of where the informations are actually uh, located um, and how we can manage and monitor them. To make this a little bit more plain and coming back to Andre's initial slide, um, basically we use the thin edge as a, a as a, the standard product or, or solution as it is provided on the official GitHub repository. And we just apply our protocol driver OPC way. Um, but you could also do that with Hotbus, for example, um, or with anything else you have. And thus, that's a very nice uh, possibility to extend uh, the thin edge with the functionalities that you already have or that you want to create without taking care of all the stuff that is here in yellow, which you actually need it if you want to go into a, a, rock solid, a rock solid solution for other customers. And with that, I haven't checked the time, Phil, but I think it looks not so bad. Again, uh, here's uh, the ThinEdge example repository, so feel free to dive into that and give us feedback uh, and open for questions where already are some. Uh, excellent, excellent. Thank, thanks, Marat. That's a um, good, uh, great, great insight. So um, I, I know we've got some uh, questions already, so let me uh, just look through. Um, so. One was uh, regarding um, uh, kind of sharing the link to the example. I'm sure we can do that um, uh, after the, after the session, or kind of uh, you pretty much know the link URL off by heart. I suspect, Murad. I will do it um, in a minute. Yes. <laughs> brilliant. Um, so there's also a question regarding um, how the information model is defined, mm -hmm. and I suspect that's probably related to the um, Oh, well, maybe all of those elements. So maybe, maybe you could actually outline that. So uh, I'm guessing uh, if you talk about information model, then you mean how the transform the transformation. OK, so I mean, we do have basically two information models here, right? So I mean, the one information model is on the OPC way server. So somebody in this in this scenario, it was me because I created the simulation server, but somebody defined an information model on the OPC UA server, right? So let's go back. Oh, I think I have it as a backup slide here as well. So yeah, so one information model is on the OPC UA server. Oh, I'm not sharing, right? I'm sorry. That's why if you share now, yeah. Yeah, I can share. Sorry. So, so one information model is on the OPC UA server. And then the cumulosity has its own yeah, information model, domain model, that's how we call it. And this means that we are talking, for example, of numeric information about measurements or that we talk about events or alarms. And now you have to do a mapping, right? So how do you want to extract information from the information model of the OPC UA server and how you want to map them to information stored in the Cumulosity domain model? So the information model of the OPC UA server comes from the OPC UA server. We scan that such that you can see it, right? So we can see actually the information uh, model and the hierarchy on the OPC UA server. And then what we are basically doing with the concept of device protocols, we define the mapping, so to say, here in the virtual in, in the UI, meaning that we say, hey, Everything you find here, for example, on a particular node ID, so for example, here in factory two, line one, machine 0815 in German, drives and power, for example, right? And this node ID, this one is used and mapped, for example, to a measurement, could also be mapped to an event. And that's basically the linking between the information model on the OPC UA and the cumulosity domain model. Uh, which is shown on the Cumulosity IoT platform. And those are defined as JSONs, yes, because everything in Cumulosity is a JSON. Brilliant. There's, there's a, I know we've only got a, another a minute or two, so um, there's a question here regarding, uh, can you define these on many devices uh, belonging to one group at once? I'm not sure, we, did you cover that or partly cover that? 
Yeah, exactly. So uh, what I just showed here was just for one one for one particular device or one particular server. What the agent, uh, what the gateway agent is also doing, haven't showed that yet, is that it looks for servers that have the same uh, the same information model on the OPC UA server. So as soon as um, we see other servers that show basically the same information hierarchy, then this one is also applied, or I can at least uh, uh, make it apply on that. So that's uh, the, I guess that's a sort of grouping uh, that uh, that is asked here. So thank you, thank you, Murad. Welcome. Thank you for the great pre great presentation. So to pivot a little, we'd like to share how Finnish.io is being used in the um, continuously innovative motorsport sector. Uh, so uh, the Software AG ERA Championship is the world's first all-electric junior Formula racing series showcasing high performance electric motorsport in a competitive environment that guarantees close racing. The vehicles are high spec automotive uh, IoT assets, sending real time data, uh, video, and are built to the latest motor, motor, um, uh, motor and battery technology available on the market. So with this, I would like to introduce Lars from Software AG, who will demonstrate how the combination of Thin Edge IO, Bellina OS, and Software AG's Cumulosity IoT deliver the high performance motorsport telemetry needed by the engineers, drivers, and fans. So, Lars, uh, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Philip. Let me share my screen. So, hi, everyone. I'm Lars Peters. I'm a solution architect at, uh, at Software AG. I've been working together with the people of uh, ERA, the Electric Racing Academy, for uh, a small year now. And uh, I wanted to share with you what uh, ERA is exactly doing and uh, how we're using Tinech for that. So kicking things off, um, what is the Software AG ERA Championship? Well, the Software AG ERA Championship is the first fully electric entry-level racing championship. So think a little bit of F4 for electric racing. It's a feeder series uh, for the more uh, senior um, racing cate categories, um, but fully electric. The idea is to give young drivers a chance to hone their skills and become the number one electric driver. I think isn't karting good enough for young drivers aspiring to be uh, the fastest electric driver? Uh, well, electric racing is a completely a different beast. Uh, with 100% torque you get from zero kilometers an hour, um, changes your dra driving style drastically, as well as the battery management, uh, which can win or lose you the race, um, especially if you are thinking about uh, recharging your battery while you're braking and how you use that recharge energy and when you use that recharge energy. So that's what ERA is doing. Uh, besides the goal of make electric cars go fast, um, the people at ERA uh, added some, some core values to, to the racing and what they want to build, what they want to bring to a, a feeder series. Um, those uh, those uh, values that they want to bring are starting off with sustainability, equality, and accessibility, besides, of course, making electric cars go fast. So sustainability in that um, ERA is trying to bring innovative technology to be researched and development, uh, developed in a highly competitive and cost-effective platform. Um, so they not only want to uh, bring sustainable cars, they want to bring a sustainable model for delivering these races and bringing chances to uh, these young drivers besides the fact that the race cars are completely electric. Um, so that makes uh, the sustainability effect also uh, pretty clear. Then equality, um, ensuring that everyone has an equal opportunity to participate in uh, motorsports is something that motorsports in itself has a long way to go. Uh, I don't think we've seen a woman in recent years in uh, Formula One, for, uh, for instance, um, there have been two already subscribed in ERA in the first series. Uh, with another uh, female driver uh, participating next year, of course. Um, and accessibility as well. I've been told by uh, by Dieter from, from IRA that apparently the cost of entering or growing into a Formula One, Formula One driver requires the driver and its team itself to already uh, put $4 million on the table. And that's before even starting uh, as a Formula, Formula One driver. With ERA, we're trying to make sure that 
this cost is uh, drastically reduced for the drivers by creating a series that is mostly um, sponsored and brought by cooperating uh, partnerships together with, uh, with ERA. Besides that, ERA also offers um, the, the small card you see on, on the right side, the, uh, that's a, a build it yourself kit for um, students who want to participate in STEM directions, uh, STEM courses in school for them to build something um, themselves and you can, uh, you can get that from ERA as well. So that's a little bit of the why ERA is doing what they're doing. Maybe it's interesting right now to take a look under the hood uh, and take a look at, at the car itself. So the Mitsubishi F110E, E for electric, boosts a 24 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, for your information, that's about half of a Nissan Leaf car and about 12 loads of laundry. If you're um, considering which one would be most fun, I would say the ERA car is, is most fun there. That 24 kilowatt hour battery pack um, is in a car that is significantly less weighty than, than the innocent the little leaf that I talked about earlier. It weighs about 690 kilograms, including the driver. Combining those two and together with a 130 kilowatts or 175 horsepower motor makes, uh, makes it so that our young drivers can go top speeds of up to 210 kilometers an hour in a fully electric car. Let me tell you, it looks exhilarating. Uh, supported by 13 inch Goodyear tires on a Dome F110 chassis, um, which racing fans might recognize from previous years in uh, Formula 4. Now that's a little bit under the hood of the car, talking about what we're doing with Thin Edge and uh, Software AG is uh, the data. Data changes everything. In every one of the lower levels of racing, there is no live data stream available. Uh, all data is captured and, and inspected later on if there is any data available. That's a big if already. What we try to do is stream that data live so that um, both the race engineers, the public, and then the drivers themselves can benefit from that data. Um, a few examples of why this is useful um, in June, I had the chance to participate or partake in the um, ERA event in, in Jarama. Um, it was then uh, 40 plus degrees Celsius in uh, Madrid, Spain. And for electric cars, fully um, powered by batteries, that was quite a challenge. So the fact that we had live feed of data uh, coming from the battery packs meant that we could keep an eye, a continuous eye on uh, the safety of the battery packs and the safety of the drivers, of course. But not only that, and it's not only safety related, but if you're teaching young drivers, um, the most um, information you get uh, is immediate feedback. So uh, the race driver can communicate with the driver immediately on how are you handling your battery, battery when are you recharging, what lines are you driving, um, how is your, um, your brake points uh, compared to other drivers, when can you push and when you should probably uh, fall back a little bit to conserve uh, battery power. I made a small video of that of uh, one of the views um, a few days ago that we had during one of the tests. Uh, it's a short clip um, of one of the views of data coming in. So um, if I play the video, we see that the ERA car is approaching a, a corner. So the accelerator pedal was at zero. And right now he's speeding up again with the torque requested uh, rising and rising and rising until the driver here reaches 116 kilometer, kilometers an hour. So that's one of the possible views with inverter information and then some general information together with a map. Next to that, uh, items we're measuring are uh, speed and acceleration. We're measuring the torque um, that the motor is request requesting. Temperature of the battery pack already talked about, that's very important. And then um, important as well is regenerated power. Regenerated power we calculate from combining the current voltages and then the currents. How does thin edge come into this? Um, in the car itself, we have a, a Raspberry Pi um, that does the calculation and reads out the Combus on the device, on the car. And then um, this uh, a Raspberry Pi boosts a, a thin edge 
that we mainly use for data mapping and sending the data towards uh, Cumulosity IoT, where we can then use it for the engineering dashboards that I've shown, uh, some audience engagement views, and then re research and development, and very importantly, um, information, teaching information for the driver. Um, the moment we start talking with uh, ERA on, on using Tinage, uh, a large part of the development had already been done in, um, in you by using a technology called Bellina. Bellina is a, a series of tools or offers a series of tools that you can use for um, managing Linux devices as um, um, remotely as Docker containers. Um, so ERA was using Bellina um, to remotely uh, update the software while, while they were developing it. What we noticed was um, while we were reading the data, we had to do a whole lot of changes in uh, software um, just to change data that we're reading out from um, the telematics and sending it to our cloud platform. So um, with the requirement, the hard requirement of using uh, Bellina itself, we couldn't just post, just put Tinage next to our ERA telematics. Um, we wanted to use Bellina as well. And that overview high level architecture looks a little bit like that. So on our Raspberry Pi, uh, firstly, we run the Bellina OS. And then in two separate containers, we run once the ERA telematics software that was already being used. And then next to that, we use Tinage for mapping uh, the devices and all the data coming from the ERA telematics and sending that to uh, Cumulosity. Um, the change of using Tinage made sure that we can um, ra more rapidly um, change what data exactly we wanted to take a look at. And uh, in coordination with the data engineers that joined for uh, this season, it's going to enable us to make uh, a lot of uh, changes towards the, the visuals a lot faster. So pretty excited for that. Um, how we came to this, this ERA telematics container next to the trash container. And uh, maybe important to note as well, uh, the communication happens, of course, via the MQTT broker by the Tinage. We expose the MQTT broker on the container uh, and then from there use Tinage data mapper to send the data towards Cumulosity. So for that, uh, I had the wonderful help of Christoph Steutner and Hans Boof of the community, which uh, were a great help in making, making sure that the um, the two containers ran nicely next to each other. So here is an example of a Docker Compose file, file that's used by the Bellina to uh, define which services are being used. So here, two services, one the ERA telematics and the one the uh, Dinech. Um, in Bellina, it looks a little bit like this, where we have uh, at the bottom of the screen, then you see two services running, one ERA telematics and one thin edge then. Um, and we can use the terminal still to log in to um, our Bellina OS and have a look at uh, what is coming in. Now at the top of your screen, uh, you see a, a small warning message, which was recently brought to the attention of ERA. Um, so that the, the past invoices, of course, Bellina as well comes with a cost. Um, so for the next season, we will try to make sure uh, to remove the uh, dependency on Bellina. A lot of the software development has been done of reading out account data, uh, and it might make sense right now to shift a large part of that uh, towards the device management uh, that, um, that was talked about earlier. So let me move to that one. So we'll try to make sure that we can manage reading, manage the, the part that's the thin edge service and that reads all the data from the canvas, um, that we can manage that next to uh, the thin edge then, um, as well as uh, we right now are sending a huge amount of data via the, the 4G modem, which is great for data gathering, but is not uh, optimal for bandwidth. So it might make sense in the coming year to uh, have a deeper look at prioritization and um, a large help there will be some analytics to be performed on the device itself. So we'll take a look at if we can use the streaming analytics uh, maybe by the, the APAMA team to, uh, to do some analytics already. A good example there would be um, right now we're sending current and voltages live, but actually we only really care about the uh, power used, uh, power used and power regenerated. So if you multiply your current and your voltage, we'll get the power and then it would be interesting if we can start integrating that power usage over different sectors of, or over different labs. Take a look at are we generating uh, 
power, how much power are we generating, and when can we use it? A big challenge that we still have, and this is my reach out to the community, a big challenge that we still have is a lack of a, an embedded engineer. So someone that likes to get his hands dirty with uh, Tinech and uh, small resource constrained devices. Uh, so if anyone in the community is interested, feel free to reach out and we'll be more than happy to have a chat with you. That's it for my presentation. Uh, once again, I would like to thank Christoph Stoitner and Hans Boe for helping technically and Philip Hooker for facilitating usage of Tinage by ERA and being the driving force, pun intended, of our cooperation. Thank you very much, everyone. Excellent, Lars. Thank, thank you very much. Great, um, great presentation. So obviously, uh, uh, being a motorsport fan, uh, I'm uh, super keen to see um, to see Thin Edge uh, being incorporated into uh, into uh, the the motorsport arena. So it's a, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, so we've got some got some questions also, Lars. That have just just come in. So do you use any pub publicly available Docker image for thinedge.io or did you build your own? So, um, still not on mute. Yeah, um, we mainly built our own. So we started off from a Alpine container and then uh, add a lot of the functionalities to, to the container. I think uh, the team won't be uh, upset if I, uh, if I share that one uh, with the community. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Lars. And there's a, another question here regarding um, the rationale to use Bellina uh, instead of real time. I, I think you, you might have mentioned that that was. I'll, I'll allow you to answer the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, there was a hard requirement from ERA and, and the people that were uh, cooperating with. So ERA is, is largely a partnership. So it's not just us working on things. Uh, we're working together with universities as well. We already uh, used Bellina a lot for development. Um, so there was a hard requirement from um, the university we're working with uh, for the software development. They would like to keep on using uh, Bellina. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and also, so the last question here we probably have time for is, um, is it possible that Finesh.io monitors other external devices uh, which are connected to the Raspberry Pi? And I think the, the answer to that is probably yes, because with this example, obviously it's actually connected to the, the other uh, Bellina container that's actually connected via CAN bus to external assets, but I, I suspect that that will be the case. So it can, mon it can monitor anything that the data. Yeah, it can monitor anything that it gets the data from. Uh, uh, what would you say, Lars? Uh, no, that's uh, that's completely right. Um, not sure if I'm the best person to to answer that in depth, um, but indeed uh, you can you can use Tinnage to monitor a whole range of devices connected to your Raspberry Pi, uh, depending as long as you have the connectivity towards the uh, the MQTT broker. Brilliant, brilliant, excellent, excellent answer. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we've kind of um, gone gone through our time for the Q and A. So move, moving on. So so let's let's change gears. So once again, no pun intended and understand how Thinedge.io is being evolved by our contributing partners. So AWS IoT collects, stores, and analyzes IoT data from millions of devices used in many industries. With over 40% of the cloud market and their IoT services integrated to other Amazon cloud services, it has become a home for many enterprises building complete solutions. So I'd like to introduce uh, Cesare and Samuel from Console Red, who will demonstrate how Thinedge.io can be config configured to connect to new and legacy AWS IoT cloud services and their associated business applications. So Cesare, over to you. Okay, thank you, Phil. So yeah, uh, our contribution is to enable the Thinage to connect to AWS. Uh, two words about the company that I work from, for. So this is a console thread. We are the software AG partner and contributor to the Thinedge project. We design and implement end-to-end -end IoT solutions with complete technical cap capability in areas of uh, hardware design and embedded software and the cloud. So here is the uh, the architecture of our presentation. So. As I said, our contribution is uh, to Thinedge extension, which allows it to connect to AWS. 
Okay, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, the, uh, the it's precisely it's the intention is to uh, connect to AWS IoT Core MQTT broker, and yeah, the components that we are using. The first one is Collect D. Collect D is a daemon that collects system performance metrics periodically. We will use CPU load and memory usage metrics. The Collect D is already integrated with the Edge, so yeah, we didn't have to do anything about about this one. And next is Thinedge itself, which contains local MQTT broker, which will connect to IoT Core broker on the cloud side. Yeah, and the data received by the broker will be stored in IAWS time stream, uh, which is a serverless time time series database uh, for IoT and time stream database will serve, serve as a data source of the vis visualization of the data that we prepared with AWS Grafana Managed Service. And yeah, so let's start. Uh, Sam will show you the, the part for, for the TinEdge and the configuration of the connection. And uh, I, will sh I will show you in a minute how the data travels through the AWS services. Sam, over to you. Thank you, Shazir. Um, so as mentioned, we have been working on adding support to ThinEdge for connecting to the AWS cloud. Um, so one of the changes that we've made is to add a mapper for AWS that takes in ThinEdge JSON and validates the JSON format. We've also extended the ThinEdge CLI tool to support configuring and connecting to the AWS cloud. So I'd like to quickly just demonstrate how to connect uh, a device running ThingEdge to AWS. So i just share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can see uh, my terminal here. Um, so the first step would be to create a device certificate and private key. Um, so we do this through ThinEdge CLI using the uh, cert create command and we pass in a device ID which is unique to the device that we're connecting to AWS. Um, so we can now, so we can view the uh, current configuration using the list command. And here we can see uh, the path to the uh, private key and to the certificate. Um, so the next step here would be to set the AWS root certificate. Um, so you can see here we have a default location for the root certificate. Um, on most Linux flavors, the AWS root certificate would already be present in this default location. Um, however, if not, it is publicly available for download and you can place it in this location or update this path if you prefer to place it somewhere else. Um, so next we want to set the URL of the AWS instance that we'll be connecting to. So the URL is unique to the AWS account and region that is being used and it can be found in the AWS um, IoT core settings. So I'll quickly just show you where you would find that. Um, so in uh, AWS IoT here, we have uh, these settings down on the left-hand side. And if we head over there, uh, we have an endpoint here. So if we head back over to the console, uh, we would uh, use the TED config set to set the key here that we're setting is aws.url. Uh, let me just copy that again. Place that URL in here. Um, we'll just use the list command again to make sure that was set correctly. Yeah, so we can see here the AWS URL has been set. Um, and the next step here is to uh, upload our client certificate to AWS. So I'll just show you how that's done. Um, so on the, on the left hand side again here, we have uh, security. And if we expand that, we have certificates. 
and inside there you will find uh, an option to add a certificate and we want to register a certificate. So here uh, we want to select the option that the CA is not registered with uh, AWS as we're using a self-signed certificate here. So we either have the option to upload a certificate signing request or we can upload the device certificate itself. So another one of the changes that we've made in ThinEdge is when you generate the um, client certificate and private key, we also generate a certificate signing request. Um, but for the purpose of the demo, we're just going to upload the device certificate as we have encountered an issue in the um, AWS uh, web console that doesn't allow us to upload the CSR, although it works fine through the um, AWS command line tool. So we just select the certificate here. And we want to hit register. Um, so it says we successfully registered the certificate. If we just head over there. Um, the next step is to attach a policy to the certificate that we've uploaded. So um, a policy is essentially a, a set of rules that are used to control access to and from the AWS instance. Um, and inside the policy, we define which topics are allowed to be used for connecting, subscribing, publishing, and receiving. Um, uh, and an example policy for AWS will be included with the changes that we've made, but I'll just quickly show you what a policy looks like. Um, so here we have a policy that's already been created. Um, so you can see here we have um, various roles for connecting, publishing, subscribing, and receiving. Um, and we define which topics we're allowed to do those actions on. Um, so when you're creating a policy, you can do it through the AWS um, rule builder. So you just select from a drop down list the, the effect. So allow or disallow the action and then the, the um, topic that you would like to allow or disallow. Um, but there's also a, a JSON format. Um, so just for testing purposes, you can we will we'll include a copy of this JSON and you can just copy and paste that in there to create a policy. So if we head back over to the certificate, uh, we want to attach a policy to the certificate. So we select our policy here and attach the policy. And then the next thing is we want to activate the certificate just from this drop down uh, at the top here, the actions drop down. Uh, so for this demo, we have collect D uh, running in the background collecting metrics on CPU and memory usage. This data is then published over a local topic in JSON format, uh, grouped using the existing collect D mapper and forwarded onto AWS. So now we want to connect to AWS uh, using the connect AWS command. So there's various checks that are going on here, um, checking the configuration. Um, it will restart the local uh, Mosquito MQTT broker with the new bridge configuration. And then it will perform a connection check to AWS. So just checking that we can uh, publish messages to and receive responses from AWS. Uh, we can see here that that is successful. Um, so I'd like to now hand you back over to Cesaria, who will show you the data received in AWS. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so yeah, uh, the AWS console, IoT Core uh, Broker console, allows us to um, to test if the if the messages are coming, so we can subscribe to all topics to see uh, if it actually works. And we we see here that there are incoming messages from the from the device side. So yeah, so in order to be able to uh, store the messages, we had to create some uh, some rule. So here is the rule. 
concerning the message routing. So you can use the CQL uh, language to extract the message, the data from the messages in JSON format. And yeah, also subscribe to the particular topic that you want to uh, get messages from. And then you define the rule action. In this case, we, we defined the uh, time stream table action, which writes messages into a time stream table. You select the database name, you select the table name. You also specify at least one dimension to the data. In our case, the dimension is a device ID, which is uh, which we used for it. We use the client ID variable. So yeah, now going to the uh, to the time stream service, there is a query editor, so we can see the data that is stored with the query. So here is the query for the. Uh, last 100 um, rows in the database. Yeah, so here is the data. We have the yeah the device ID as a defined uh, dimension. We have a measurement name. Uh, these are the memory percent usage and CPU percent uh, active. These are the timestamp of the data incoming and the values for 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 this data. And on top of this database, we have set up the Grafana workspace where we define the data source as a, a Amazon time stream data. And we have prepared um, a visualization in the Grafana to, to see actually how the data is coming to the, to the, uh, to the backend. So here we can, we can choose the device ID, we can choose the um, the time span of the of the data. We can turn uh, auto reload to five seconds, for example. We can choose the period that we are interested in. So uh, it can be a historical data or the current value. So if we choose here, we can see uh, the memory usage last value, the maximum value, and yeah, uh, the uh, average value and the number of measurements that uh, are in this time span, and the same for the for the CPU here. Yeah, so we can uh, yeah, let's see last five minutes. So these are the measurements in the last five minutes. We got a two, two, 224 measurements, and these are the values and 223 measurements for the CPU. So yeah, to sum up, sum up. Uh, the steps, what we presented is creation of the certificate on the uh, ThinEdge site, uh, setting of the URL to AWS IoT Core, setting up the AWS, so we uploaded the self-signed uh, certificate for the device, we attached the policy uh, to allow uh, subscription, publishing and connecting to the, to the topics, to the backend. We activated the certificate, connected the ThinEdge site, so ThinEdge um, broker to the AWS. And in the uh, AWS, we have shown that the mess messages are being collected, the rules to, of IoT Core that is uh, storing the data to the time stream database and the query the data. And yeah, we have shown the dashboard of the live view and historical data in uh, prepared Grafana dashboard. So that's all from my side. And back to you, Philip. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Trezor and Samuel. So it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant presentation there. So let me. Um, so I think it's it's great great to see how you've uh, evolved uh, Finish to make it um, kind of better connectable to AWS IoT. So it's um, it's really, uh, really great to see that. So uh, that that allows kind of many companies who are actually already using. Uh, AWS IoT to adopt perhaps more of a, um, a platform agnostic approach to their develop, um, the device software developments. So it's um, it becomes a, it's a good enabler. So uh, Samuel and Cesare, I believe the the project would be is going to be um, uploaded to GitHub soon, isn't it? So it should be available for everyone uh, shortly. That's correct. Yeah, we're uh, expecting to uh, submit. Uh, probably in the next couple of days, so it should be should be publicly available shortly. Hopefully, brilliant, brilliant, excellent, excellent. So once again, th thank you, uh, thank you, thank you very much. So I know we've kind of um, 
moving along our time quite quite quickly. So not 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 to uh, uh, not to belittle anybody else's great presentation, but um, I think we saved the best to last. So so Yocto uh, Yocto is a, an open source project that provides templates, tools, and methods to aid the creation of custom Linux-based embedded uh, system deployments, regardless of the hardware architecture. It is widely used and widely supported, featuring a highly active developer community and is backed by the Linux Foundation. So without further ado, and I know you're excited to um, go through, I would like to introduce uh, Marcel for Initum, who will demonstrate how Finnish.io can be deployed in the Yocto framework to make embedded Linux simpler and more accessible for IoT projects. So Marcel, uh, over to you. Okay, so hello, uh, thank you, Philip, and hello, everybody, uh, to the presentation about deploying in uh, deploying uh, Thinage IO for the Octo embedded framework. Uh, my name is Marcel, and at Inetum, I've been working on uh, supporting Octo uh, for, uh, for Thinage. Uh, so you might ask, what is Octo? Um, so Octo is, uh, is used to build Linux distributions that tr that run on low power IoT devices. Uh, Yocto distributions are built from source and they're very customizable, so you can start from scratch and basically only add the packages and uh, software that you need. Uh, with official support, we can provide easy way to use Thinage IO in Yocto based projects. Uh, fundamental building blocks of Yocto are packages which are then grouped into, layer, into layers, which contain related functionality. Uh, we will be providing a Thinage IO layer, which contains all Thinage uh, components, uh, as well as Thinage IO reference image, which I will be showing you uh, in a demo. Uh, so, uh, support the demo. Um, to um, to basically to run this uh, to run this image, the first thing you you have to do is to clone um, the Pocky uh, repository. Uh, and here I have uh, already uh, cloned it, so uh, I won't be running that. Next, we go into the uh, into the directory. And then uh, we need to select which version of, of Yocto we are going to use. We uh, use Kirkstone, which is the latest version. OK, and then we can uh, execute the uh, script, which will configure our uh, built environment. OK, and uh, the script has placed us in the build directory in which we will be uh, configuring uh, uh, our build. So uh, the next step is to add, uh, uh, add a line that says that we will be using systemd. Uh, so uh, we are going to use systemd because that's uh, what we uh, started with uh, in, our, in our layer. Uh, uh, you might uh, know that uh, Thinage IO also supports uh, initd, but um, systemd is what uh, we uh, use in our layer for now, and we might also add uh, support for initd in the future. Uh, so here you can see uh, we have the line in our config. Next, uh, we will be adding all uh, the uh, so uh, we clone these two repositories, uh, and I have already have them cloned uh, right here. So uh, then we run bit by layers command and add uh, these all layers. Um, and after that, uh, we run bit by touch image, and afterwards. Afterwards, we can ra launch this image with uh, uh, QEMU. So, okay. So, uh, 
on my side it finished up very quickly be, because I have already done that, but if you will be doing this for the first time, uh, you will need quite a, uh, quite a lot of uh, disks, uh, disk space and time, so be warned. And now we can uh, run QEMU. Uh, to see uh, our image in KMU emulator, 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 sorry. So, okay, so we log in and we, as you can see, we have a uh, thin edge uh, available in our uh, emulator. So we are going to power off. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can extend uh, your base image by creating your own layer uh, via this command. And then you can either create a new image based on the edge image. So you can extend the our reference image that we just built, uh, or you can use a base image in the Pocky repository and just pick and choose which packages from our layer uh, you uh, you want to use. And uh, for more, you can read Yocto Project Development Task Manual. And uh, also uh, in the presentation and are the links to our layer repository and uh, support tracking issue for Yocto. Uh, in Thinage IO repository. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we, 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 yeah, uh, that will be all. Uh, ex excellent. Thank, thanks, uh, Marcel. And, and you were, uh, you were a, a champion to uh, cope with the technical uh, technical issues you had there. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That. Yeah, so, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I, I think what, what is um, uh, well, what is kind of so so great for me? So uh, so both um, so Marcel's presentation, but also uh, for Samuel and uh, so Tresor, just just showing um, how we're trying to well, how the Thinish project is actually trying to incorporate the, um, uh, the 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 newest uses of technologies, whether it's kind of connecting to AWS because it's got forty percent of the IoT, forty percent of the cloud market, or it's actually connecting and using uh, Yocto, which is one of the most heavily used. Uh, embedded system uh, kind of frameworks. So try, trying to use that and getting our kind of great contributing partners, kind of Intertum and Consult Red to actually help us help us get that, which is which is really good, really good. Question here from uh, uh, Kala uh, Marcel. So uh, when when running on your target environment, what are the uh, resource requirements for for the Yocto deployment? Okay, so uh, base uh, the uh, requ uh, the requirements are not very high. Uh, what uh, requirements uh, there will be depend on what base image you are using and what software is uh, part of that uh, base image. Uh, when we were testing, uh, we were running uh, on Raspberry Pi uh, and uh, it's been working on Ra Raspberry Pi, but uh, the requirements are probably, uh, they can be lower. Yes, yeah, so kind of just cl clarifying. So um, if it's just a, um, uh, what kind of um, what kind of memory or uh, CPU overhead? I, I think maybe maybe the maybe the question is actually related to um, so uh, Thinage to IO requires between sixteen and thirty two megabytes of RAM. Um, does does Yocto does a Yocto implementation require more if more how much more do you know? Or is that something we can come back come back with an answer for? We haven't noticed any observable uh, overhead. So uh, if you can run Thinage IO, uh, you can probably run it on on Yocto as well. Okay, so so we we yeah, yeah. Um, we 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 check that because we we obviously um uh, uh we're keen to make sure Thinage IO is applicable for the large majority of resource restricted devices that use embedded Linux in some form. So we're keen to make sure that uh, overheads uh, as small as possible. Also, also recognize that it needs to be easily deployable. So use because use of containers in Yocto type environments actually helps us. So we're trying to keep it um, uh, low. Um, there's another question here. Uh, so is it possible to distributed deployment all our additional Yocto meta layer on edge devices? 
do we need only Git or more tools like Docker or Edge device? Um, OK, so uh, to build uh, the uh, the Octo image, uh, you need to um, you need to have a certain uh, a certain OS and certain packages uh, to uh, to use uh, to use Yocto and use the Bitbake tool to build uh, the image. But once you have the image built, you can deploy them uh, on your devices. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcel. And thank you. So we've come come to end our, come to the end of our session today. Uh, we'd like I'd like to thank all the uh, presenters and demonstrators. So I, I I really enjoyed it. So kind of sort of sat back here, kind of uh, watching uh, all the great things that are happening with Finesh.io. and I think that I think that uh, uh, yourselves did as well. Uh, I'd like to make you aware that most of the contributors are, are recruiting in this space. So please spread the word to those in your uh, those are in your in your networks that may want to come come aboard in a more professional capacity. Uh, with that, with that, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. Stay safe, and uh, we'll be seeing you in the next meetup. Uh, that's either going to be in uh, late November or early December. So thank you for attending, and we look forward to speaking to you next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>